what we'd like to do is just talk about teams and teams working together. So, but the next slide, the next slide had a question for you and I wanted you to share something this morning. Thank you. Share something this morning that made you smile. So, feel free. What, what made you smile this morning? Dr. Saman. Dr. Saman? In particular? Well, he, throughout this whole talk, he, uh, he, uh, he was very humorous and lots of great points. Good. Anyone else? I was in the same seminar. Same thing? I was smiling at the same things. Okay. Same thing, same thing. Well, that's good. Anyone else? Yeah, I smile yet today? No? Of course not, Mickey. I'm not just smile, but joy to see in the morning, to see the kids, then to see friends, so this is joy. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. One of your kids has a camera. <laughs> Something that made you smile? Oh, for us, coming back after a few years, just seeing, you know, good, good, good friends is always brings a smile. Okay. So smiling is really helpful for teams. Uh, getting to know what makes us smile, getting to understand things that bring us joy helps pull people together. I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but before we do, I want to share something else. This is called a state of mind chart, and it's great with teams in any kind of meetings. You have this dark line here that's kind of neutral. Anything below the line is kind of a negative feeling. It could be being tired. Uh, it could be angry, could be stressed, anything like that. Things above the line, happy, content. So the purpose of this tool is to get a read on people very quickly without having to have people explain really where they are. So instead of names, which we could stick in here like this, we simply have a number. So where are you right now? Anybody, everybody above the line? Anybody below the line? You want us to call out numbers? Yeah, call out a number. Where are you? Two. You're a two. Great. One and a half. One and a half? <laughs> Fine. You could do that. Two. One. One. Okay, fairly ended, yes. You look like you're trying to decide. Minus one. minus one, that's totally appropriate. Minus one. So this is just a real easy way to find out how your team is without being invasive. Where is everybody today? We're a uh, one, I'm a two. I'm a minus three. Oh, really? Do you need something from us? This is just a very simple tool, uh, again, just to find out from your team where everybody is. Now we're going to come back to this because this is really important for leaders of teams to understand where they are. Um, so state of mind chart. Uh, something else about this chart is wherever you are now, you, Scott, you're at a what? One and a half? One and a half. One and a half. You're not going to stay at a one and a half all day. Your states of mind change. And it's important to be aware of where you are at a, at a certain frame of mind. Like, I remember when my kids were young, if I was like a minus one or a minus two, if they were to ask me something, my response would be, well, if you need an answer right now, the answer is no. But if you can wait, then the answer might change. Because they knew what my state of mind was. And I wanted to communicate that to them. And being aware of our state of mind is really important for how our teams move forward. Because there might be a meeting where everybody's a minus two, and you're not going to be very productive. You're going to have a lot of conflict. And then it might be time to say, okay, well, let's take a break. Let's go outside. Let's get some water. Let's do something else. So state of mind chart, uh, again, a very helpful tool. This is a chart from uh, the Gallup Global uh, Emotions Survey. And we all know in the past few years, a couple of years back, uh, we all went through COVID. And that 
dramatically impacted people's emotional state. What's interesting is that there has been a decline in the emotional happiness of people or an increase in unhappiness of people since around 2007. So even before COVID, but it's been accelerated. And some of those big causes, I'm not sure if you can see it in the back, poverty, hunger, work, lack of meaning, and loneliness. Now, poverty and hunger are actually on a decline, so that's good. But lack of meaning in work and loneliness at work or in teams is a significant contributor to a lack of happiness. Now, it was great to hear the report from Ramon, really appreciated both the stories and the, how the growth of what's going on with Red River, and uh, nice to have your team with you here as well, the team here as, as well. But when teams are working together very well, tremendous things can be accomplished. When they're not working so well, things get slowed down tremendously. Well, let's first of all define a team. And this is a quotation from a book, uh, The Wisdoms of Teams, very nice book. The author says this, There's a team is a small number of people with complementary skills who committed to a common purpose, performance goals, and approach for which they hold themselves mutually accountable. And I've highlighted the key thoughts here. Small number of people. If you have... 20 plus people, that's probably not a team, that's more likely a work group. Complementary skills, each one doing something different that blends with one another. Common purpose, looking forward to one thing, and that are accountable. Accountability in accomplishing that. So that is a team, and we could think of lots of different dynamics or the ways teams are um, put together. But um, for our time together, I want to focus, again, on how we interact with one another. And a lot of this has come from neuroscience and uh, the tremendous insights from neuroplasticity. When I say neuroplasticity, what does that mean? The ability of the brain to change. The of the brain to change. And what's really astonishing is, you know, 50 years ago, most scientists did not believe the brain had the ability to change. It was fixed. That's really not true at all. And that the brain has a tremendous capability for change. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. And, but what's interesting to me is how Ellen White brought this out a long, long time ago. So here's a couple of quotes that not really develop on teams, but they highlight for us what, she, what I would describe as her referring to neuroplasticity. Steps to, um, Sanctified Life, page 93. We should accustom ourselves to lift the thoughts often to God in prayer. If the mind wanders, what should we do? Bring it back. And then the next couple of, sentence, next couple of words? By persevering effort, habit will finally make it what? Easy. So what's happening here? Your brain is actually changing. Your thinking pattern and your habits are actually making a physical change in the brain. If the mind wanders, bring it back. The first couple of times, first couple of times, you know, first long time, it's hard. It's still hard sometimes. But eventually, habit makes it easy. So what's happening? The brain is changing. Uh, another thought here. This is from youth instructor, uh, March 9, 19, 1893. God help us to cultivate habits of thought, word, look, and action that will testify to all about us that we have been with Jesus and learned of him. I, I really, this quotation is so all-encompassing. Habits of thought... Well, that had to do with the other one. Word, we train ourselves to speak a certain way. And then habits of look and action. How much control do we have over our facial expressions? Not much. Is that what you said? Not much. Yeah, sometimes we have an experience 
And then all of a sudden, there's a reaction. Good news is there's actually about a half of a second window of time between whatever it is that's triggering us and our reaction where we could move in a different direction. Now, half a second's not very much. Not very much. But again, in the morning, if we've been praying and asking God, please step in when I'm about to have a wrong look or action. But again, cultivating habits of thought, word, and action. Um, Mind, character, and personality, page 657. We should discipline the mind to think in a healthful channel and not to permit it to dwell upon things that are evil. Again, all of this is simply neuroplasticity at work, the, the reframing of our neurons and our interactions with one another. And this becomes very important with teams because, as we mentioned, teams are small groups of people that are interacting together. And our expressions, our words, our actions have a tremendous broad impact on others. Um, it's called emotional contagion, and we'll get through that a little bit later as we go through. So there's a law uh, developed by the scientist by the name of Hebbs, uh, and his, his forming of what we're talking about this morning, the neuroscience, he's got this very simple expression that says, neurons that fire together wire together. So that's pretty simple. Do you want to try saying that? You're hesitant. I can see it in your face. Neurons that fire together. So what does that mean? Well, neurons that respond to an external stimulus or are close to one another in our brains as well, as they respond to this external sim- stimulus, that bond becomes stronger. In other words, if I'm walking down the road and I see a snake and I react, well, the visual image of the snake has what? It's caused a reaction. The next time I see a snake, there's going to be a reaction. The next time I see the snake, there's going to be a reaction unless I can engage neuroplasticity and say, you know, let me look at the snake differently. So if a snake came in here, how, what would your reaction be? If I could, if I could take a, just read a morning story of a man, oh no, it was your talk. Didn't read it, heard it. How about the man that was bit by the copperhead? So uh, Simone, let's say you had your cop, that copperhead with you and we let it out on the floor. What's everybody's reaction gonna be? Move, right? Unless you're like my son who, when we first moved to Africa, began catching poisonous snakes as a hobby. His reaction was, oh, how can I catch this? So neurons that fire together, wire together. Now, you may think it's beneficial to run when you see a copperhead. Probably is a good idea not to get too close to it. But there are other actions in life where when we interact with somebody, we have a certain reaction. And the more that happens, the tighter the bond gets. Now, if it's in a positive direction, that's great for teams. But if it's not in a positive direction, it can destroy team trust and growth. What do I mean? Let's say you have a team member um, who comes in late, and you're first, you notice there he's, he's in late, he's in late for a meeting or in late for a presentation, whatever it is, they're late. And so you notice, oh, they're late. Neurons that fire together, wire together. I've noticed you've come in late. Now I'm going to make a judgment. You are late. You are. You're not just late today. You are late. And then they come in the next time. Oh, they're late. Now, I don't know to them that both times they've been doing door-to-door work or they got a flat tire or there's reasonings, but all of a sudden in my mind, I'm making a judgment. You're late. I see something and I react. It's important for us to understand what's going on because if not, we'll destroy the dynamics that make healthy teams. Well, what are some of those dynamics? Well, let's look at... 
Um, six stages of team growth, and teams go through this. There's the, uh, you can see this little pinwheel, uh, forming and connecting, storming, norming, performing, dorming, and then hopefully transforming. Well, what does this mean? Let's break it down in a little bit more detail. So the form and connect stage, that's when a team just comes together. It's new. During that time, everybody's on their best behavior. You know, it's kind of like the first date. You're just, everybody's going to be on their best behavior. Or you first meet somebody, you're not going to speak negatively. Or you're going to try to put the best foot forward. So that's the forming. Everybody's uh, polite and trying to avoid conflict. Storming and, and clarifying, that's the next stage of the team. And that's when, you know, you can only be polite and have a facade for so long. And then your true personality comes out. And the other person's true personality comes out. And teams begin to clash. And they're storming. And they're, this can actually be a very productive phase or it can actually be a very destructive phase in, in terms of how the team handles it. Finally, we move to this third stage where we're solidified. We really are a team now. And notice trust is really important here. There's a common purpose, there's a we, we are being successful, and there's, excuse me, solid trust in the team. When we get to that stage, then we can really move forward. And that's performing. You know, we're very mature, there's a high level of effectiveness, we're able to take risks. Um, really good point of the team. Unfortunately, once a particular task or a few tasks are accomplished, the team is in danger of becoming tired and then drifting. Fortunately, there's always the possibility of transformation. Something else happens, and then we refocus and we have this rebirth, or we stop the team. That's also a possibility if teams are put together for a particular purpose. However, this cycle of a team, it's something that, most every team goes through, and something that speeds the growth from forming and connecting to performing is how well the team members can trust one another. There's a book written uh, by Stephen Covey's son, I forgot his name, it's called The Speed of Trust, and how quickly people can trust one another. So trust is a very key point to this, and in relation to teams, this is a fairly important st statistic, that 50 to 70% of, of a people in an organization, the way they view the work climate relates to their immediate boss. So if team members feel like, oh, you know, something's really wrong here, it's usually their relationship with the immediate boss, which we'll come back to again uh, as we look at different aspects of this. So let's think here of predictors of team success. And these are four different predictors, and uh, they were rated. Now, we might think that the worst, excuse me, rest, work, balance would be the highest predictor of team success, how well they did that, but it's really not true. And it wasn't innovation or empathy, but it was the top one, psychological safety. How safe do team members feel in that organization? And by safe, I'm not, obviously, I'm not talking about physical safety here. We're calling this psychological safety. There's a book called The Coaching Habit. Um, and in the book, the author of the book makes a comment, which I have not been able to verify, but he makes a comment that uh, neuroscience has indicated that we are scanning our environment all the time to find out whether we are safe here or not. And that there's just constant, you know, running in the background of the mind, okay, is everything okay here? Um, if that's true, and there seems to be evidence for it, that's one of the questions that team members are asking. Am I really safe here? How easy is it in your team, in your organization, to have real heartfelt conflict conversations? 
Is that a barrier? Is there a high barrier to that? Or do people really feel like they have this circle of safety rather than a, calling it a psych psychological safety? Let's just call it the circle of safety in the team where team members are really able to engage and open up. Um, this is from Patrick Lencioni and his five dysfunctions of a team. And you notice that at the base of his pyramid, he puts the absence of trust as the major fault of teams that do not produce well. And then it goes up. If I don't really trust you, then I'm gonna be afraid of conflict. And I'm not really gonna bring out my concerns to you if I don't trust you. Then you're really not gonna have my commitment. And then I'm not gonna be accountable and then we're really not gonna have a lot of results. That's Lencioni's view. But again, this foundation of trust and the circle of safety that we've been talking about, that's an area where people in the team really sense, yes, I'm safe here, no matter what happens. So let's look at four different areas of trust, um, of safety rather. First of all, learner safety. What could that mean? Well. What happens when I make a mistake on a team? How do people respond to my mistake? Am I chastised? Or do people say, oh, that was a mistake. What can we learn from it? Learner safety is this framework where everybody on the team knows, yeah, it's okay to make mistakes. That's how we learn. Or they understand that in this team, I can ask those questions that seem silly. Uh, have you ever been in that situation where you wanted to ask a question, but everybody else seemed to know what was going on? Have you ever been in one of those situations? I have a really helpful tool for that. If you're ever in one of those and you want to ask a question, just do, I do this all the time. Say, look, I'm sorry, I'm the idiot in the room, but could you explain that again for me? And you'd be surprised when you ask a question like that, how many other people nod their heads and like, yeah, I was wondering the same thing. But we're just, we're afraid to say something because there's not learner safety. You know, we have this feel that, well, I should know what's going on. No, we don't have to know what's going on. Um, challenger safety. You know, is it okay to disagree with the boss? Is it okay to, to have disagreements here? Can I challenge you in a safe way. Collaborator, can I debate with you about the way we're going to do something? Can we rethink ideas here? Uh, do I feel included in this? Or am I part of the team that somehow is the orphan in the team? I'm, you know, the stepchild. I'm not really included in the team. All of these are very important for having that circle of safety in a team, where team members feel like, yeah, no, I'm included, I can debate, I can even disagree, and if I make a mistake, nobody's gonna kick me out. Um, years ago, uh, when I was working with OCI, uh, my vice president, um, Craig Harding, great guy, president of Riverside right now, we were working to buy real estate to fund the work of OCI. And there was a point where we were almost completely out of money and we had a down payment that we had given to a bank um, to purchase some real estate and it was put there uh, kind of like a good faith deposit. And uh, one of the things that he made a mistake on was that they wanted to keep that money for a year. We couldn't touch it. And I didn't realize that. Uh, we were kind of, we could see it on the balance sheet, but we really couldn't access it. And when we found that out, that was a very stressful period of time. And I remember talking with Craig about it. It's like, oh, we made a mistake. You know, it wasn't you made a mistake, it's we made a mistake, what can we learn from this? You know, how do we create that kind of an atmosphere in our teams where people can actually own up oh, you know, actually, I made this mistake, and they don't sense there's going to be uh, repercussions for it. Um, sorry for my graphic art here, but I don't know if you can see it up in the top, that side, the way you're looking. There's a little word there, 
Oxytocin? And what is oxytocin? Okay, so it's a hormone. Uh, it's made in the hypothalamus. It's excreted through the pituitary gland, and it's very active, particularly in um, childbirth and in nursing, and it is this bonding hormone. Uh, media has picked up on it and calls it the love hormone or the cuddling hormone, but it's much more than that. It's really a social bonding hormone. Um, and... There's this game, um, <clears throat> it's called the ultimatum game. So I, let's see, how can I, uh, I should have brought some money here. Let's see, who's got 10 bucks in their pocket? I do. do you really? I do. You have $10? No. Oh, generous guy. Would you mind? Come on up. Give me 10 bucks. You're going to want it back, I'm sure, but no, no, it's just, you lost it. It's gone now. Now, we're just going to do an illustration. I'll give you your money back there. Okay. Oh, okay. So, all right. So, now I need another participant, the recipient. The ultimatum gain is this. Here, why don't you come up here and um, would you come up as well? Yes, please. Would you come back up? Come, come. Thank you. The ultimatum gain is very simple. This individual, they don't know each other. They can't even see each other. This is the ultimatum gain. He decides that he's going to give an unknown person $10 or $100. She decides whether she's going to keep it all or she's going to split any with him. What are you going to do? I decide to split with him. You're going to split it with him? Yes. How? What, what percentages? Half of it. Half of it. How many people would have done that? Yeah, most of you. You guys are so trusting. Okay, sit down. Thanks. Here's your money again. The point of the game is that um, some people will not split half. They'll keep $9 and they'll give him $1. Now, he has another opportunity. If he doesn't like the split, he can say No and then nobody gets any money. That's the ultimatum game. And I don't know why psychologists do it, but they do it. They want to find out how people act. Now, the important point in the game is this. They gave participants a whiff of oxytocin before the game. And they found out that the whiff of oxytocin made it so both participants, the giver would be very, very generous, and the receiver would always split. Why? Because oxytocin, as a hormone, builds social connections, even though they didn't know each other. More than that, they couldn't even see each other. It was all done by computer. But the increase of oxytocin, and the study was very rigorously connected. Um, it didn't make them gamble more or anything like that. But the increase of oxytocin made them cooperate more. So, how can we increase oxytocin in our teams? Because if we can increase oxytocin in our teams, then there's greater cooperation. Now, I'm not suggesting that we need to give people inhale, uh, an inhaler of oxytocin. That would be tremendously impractical. But just as neurons that fire together wire together, if I inhale oxytocin, it'll make me more trusting. On the other hand, if I am more trusting, it'll increase my oxytocin. So rather than giving everybody that little of oxytocin, we need to learn how to build trust. And so let me share seven steps to building trust. First step, again, in a team is what I'm calling a stress challenge. <clears throat> and that is, as a team leader or in teams, that the tasks that are presented to the team needs to be of a certain level of difficulty. If it's too easy, 
it, this won't work. If it's too hard, that won't work. Actually, it has to be, you know, kind of a Goldilocks situation where the stress is challenging enough, but also doable. When we give, us, when we give tasks to workers, team members, that are not overly simplistic or not impossible, with a certain level of stress, it does two things. It increases oxytocin, and it also increases this other long word, adrenocorticotropin, which does two things. It increases focus, and it builds social connection. Increases trust. Builds social connection. So giving ta team members tasks that are proportionate. Again, they're not too easy, and they're not going to be too hard, but they're right in this Goldilocks zone of just difficult enough. Helps build trust. It increases oxytocin and helps build trust in the team. Another way to build trust in a team is to take your hands off and don't micromanage other people's work. Give individuals discretion in how they are going to accomplish their task. Now, some leaders are on one end of this where they don't give any direction at all and just team members do whatever they want. That's not what I'm advocating. And other leaders are on the far other side where they want to micromanage everything and they're going to put out exactly how you should accomplish things. That's not the point. But again, somewhere where there's direction, this is the task that needs to be done, and we'll clarify that at, toward the end of our program, our seminar together today, but also giving individuals latitude, discretion in how they're going to do the work. It's much more important and much more effective for us to say, this is the end task that I want, and this is what I want it to look like. Now you go ahead and get it done rather than dictating the way things work. Uh, there was one study I was reading where 25% of the people surveyed said they would give up a pay raise if they could have freedom in the way they worked. So more valuable than money for many people is independence, which incidentally is a, is a key factor and driver in our sense of well-being and satisfaction in life. Another key point here um, on helping build teams and increasing trust is to just over-communicate. Really learn to share information repeatedly and broadly. Just over and over again, letting people know this is what the plan is. There's nothing worse than for a team to find out, oh, this is what we're doing? After it's all been discussed and hashed out and team members feel like, wish somebody had told me about this, I might have had an idea that could help change this or correct this. So learn to share information very broadly. This, as well, increases trust in the team. The next one feels like it's counterproductive, and that is accountability. And you remember that was part of our definition of a team. Accountability. Hold team members accountable. Now, when you say accountability, 80% of people feel that that's negative, that they react negatively to being held accountable. Um, why do you think that is? Why such a reaction? Nobody wants to, oh, what was that word? Nobody wants, to, Nobody wants to be blamed. Okay. Now, is there a difference between accountability and blaming people? Uh, many people think it's the same. Well, accountability is, I, I need to make sure that you meet these metrics, these goals that we're saying. And I'm going to make sure that you're accountable, that you do it. Being blamed, again, uh, -uh. I... I made a mistake, has that has that negative connotation. Remember those circles of safety? Now, there are times where people are responsible. But again, if there's a strong foundation, um, 
the negative response will be minimized. What are some other reasons that people don't like accountability? Well, the consequences. I mean, consequences. Okay, so that there's consequences uh, to this not getting done. Um, yeah, there's all sorts of ways. You know, in, in child raising, accountability is really important. Uh, helping children learn to become accountable. So, um, accountability actually has a tremendous benefit for teams. Although 80% of people reject accountability, and that's probably, my opinion, is probably because they've had micromanagers and they didn't like that, or they don't like being pushed toward a certain goal, which we need at different times. Remember that stress that creates the oxytocin. Um, we need to have those stretch goals at different times. But here are five benefits of mutual accountability in teams. And when I say mutual accountability, it's not just the boss, the leader of the team, holding the workers accountable, but the workers are enabled to hold the leader accountable. Because we have this circle of safety, no, that's not the way we talk to one another here. And the workers are able to also have uh, a level of accountability. So five, to five different aspects here, benefits of mutual accountability in teams. First of all, there's much less anxiety and worry. Seems counterproductive, but it's true. If we all know that we're accountable and people are gonna follow through with their tasks, there's much less stress and worry. Not surprisingly, it actually pushes performance up. And when performance rises, how does the entire team feel about itself? It's better. Well, we're meeting our aims. We're meeting our goals. Again, as I've mentioned several times already, it builds trust, you know, a strong foundation for integrity. Um, there's a high level of good energy in the organization and then collaboration <clears throat> back to that. <clears throat> excuse me, that circle of collaborative safety as well. All of these rise when we hold team members accountable. But one of the reasons we don't hold team members accountable is the way we ask for certain things and the way we assign certain things. So let's just take a moment about that. And here are these two things, clear asks versus soft requests and then clear assignments. One reason we don't hold people accountable is the way we ask them to do things. So have you ever been in a meeting where somebody said, probably the leader, said something like, well, you know, we really need to inform person X about this soon. And you know, yeah, we all need to inform this person about this soon. Okay. And it feels like something's been communicated but it's very ethereal. Um, clear requests are very specific. Rather than we need to let person X know about this soon, we have something, a little acronym here called TASTY. Uh, a clear request is very targeted. Scott, could you drive so-and-so at Friday at three o'clock to a certain place, and then I get a yes or a no. Clear requests are very specific. They're targeted. They're targeted to a certain purpose, person. They're actionable. They're something that can be done. They're specific, exactly what needs to be done. They are time bound, and I'm going to get a yes or a no. Well, actually, I might not just get a yes or a no. I might get, well, I can't do it then, but I can do it another time. Yes, no, or maybe there's an alternative. But if I don't ask somebody like this, it's very hard for me to hold anybody accountable. Because I, you know, I said, uh, can you get that report out? Oh, yeah, I'll get it out. Okay. Two weeks go by, I don't have the report. So where's the report? Well, I'm working on it. What's missing? Time bound. Can you get the report to me by Friday? Can you get the report to me by next week? In order to hold people accountable in relation to this team trust, I also need to be very clear in how I ask people things. It's astonishing to sit in meetings and listen to the conversation that goes through and, and find out that really a request 
has not really definitively been named and people just like, oh yeah, this really needs to get to God, get to be, needs to be done, excuse me, but nobody's assigned it. So clear requests. Um, but the other um, part of that is clear assignments. In order to hold people accountable, I need to be clear in my assignments. Now you'll notice this is almost like tasty, targeted, actionable, specific, time-bound, but what's the last thing here? This is not a request. This is an assignment. Now people, if it's really a request, people can say, no. Okay, you can't do that. Let me find someone else. But if something is assigned, then it's not a yes or a no. It's much more of a directive. This is what I want you to do. Uh, years, I have a friend uh, named Dan Rocker. He's a pastor in Michigan. And we've gone on lots of long canoe trips in Canada. It's one of the, we haven't done any for a couple of years, but we used to go every summer, you know, a week, two weeks, different rivers, rapids, lakes, lots of different places. Wonderful time with Dan. One time we were um, shuttling from one place to another, and along the way, he asked, do you want to stop and get something to eat? And I said, yes. And then he said, well, you know, if we stop for something to eat, we might miss getting into the campground before it closes. And then I responded a bit abruptly, well, if you didn't really want to give me a choice, why did you ask me? So, don't ask a team member, can you do something, if what you're really saying is, do something. If it's a directive, make it a directive. If it's really a request, then fine, make it a request. And we had a little battle back and forth in the car, and we did not get something to eat. Uh, so, uh, ways of inc increasing trust in the team, again, stress challenge, tasks that are are challenge the person's abilities, but not too hard. Freedom to do the work they want to do as they see best. Complete sharing of information within the organization. Accountability, again, very important for developing trust in the team. And then this next thing here, developing others. Learning how to coach and develop other team members. Looking for ways to increase the effective, effectiveness of your team. Thinking, oh, well, maybe this seminar would be good for this team member. Or asking them, do you have a particular niche area that you'd like to grow on? Can we get you an online course? Can we facilitate something for you? Looking to develop other leaders as well. Your team, excuse me, your team members as well. Uh, and the book that I mentioned earlier, The Coaching Habit, uh, has actually seven good questions that you could learn relatively quickly. You don't have to read the book. Uh, you can just get the seven questions. And they're very helpful in developing team members, helping team members grow. This also increases trust. Why? Because the team member realizes you're interested in them as a person. You know about their life. You care about them. And so that, as well, increases trust. And... I said I have seven, I do have seven. This is number six, and uh, this one is vulnerability. And that is recognizing the importance of sharing with the team, the, not the full details of everything that you have, but certain trials or difficulties that you, as a leader, are having in the team. Uh, maybe there's an area that you don't have a particular strength in, um, but vulnerability is, is key. Uh, Brene Brown from the researcher in Texas writes, we need, to, we need trust to be vulnerable and we need to be vulnerable to build trust. Okay? So there has to be some circle of safety there where I feel I can speak to this group of people and I'm not going to be ridiculed or I'm not going to be misunderstood. I can be open with this group of people and that's not with everybody. And there are different, obviously, different levels. There are certain things that each one of us would share with a friend that we're not going to just share with a stranger. But in your team, we need to find these levels of appropriateness in which we can share that helps the team grow. 
Now, these are a uh, um, list of myths about vulnerability. Many people just think that, well, if I'm vulnerable, that's weak because I should be, you know, uh, self-supporting Superman of some kind, um, or I can just do it on my own. I can just keep going. I don't really need a team. By the way, uh, let's think about that. What's the greatest work that's ever been done in the world? Jesus dying on the cross. What? The, the death of Christ, right? Going to the cross. So that was a single act. It was the work of Christ himself. But he entrusted it to a team of frail, human, broken disciples that were clueless, right? <laughs> Finally, the day of Pentecost comes and they really become this team that no longer are they jockeying for the highest position, but they realize they need one another. Leaders that feel like I can do this all by themselves are completely missing out on the gift that God's given to us of being able to interact with other people. You know, the, Jesus entrusted the greatest act in the world to a group of, of people that were frail and totally imperfect and learning to come together. Um, another myth here is that trust comes before vulnerability. And so this is kind of like, you know, one of those which one comes first. Um, I sh Brene Brown said on the earlier slide, I need to have trust to be vulnerable, but I need to be vulnerable to have trust. So which one's going to come first? There's got to have some kind of synergy, but it doesn't need to be this full, throw, full uh, deep trust, but just a level where I feel safe here, and then I open up. And when I open up, that creates greater trust in the organization. Uh, and vulnerability is not disclosure. It's not like, oh, I need to let you know all the terrible things that are going on inside my head. That's not what we're talking about. But recognizing being open with particular difficulty I might have that's appropriate to the team or a challenge, or when we talked about our state of mind chart, hey, you know, today I'm at a three, and I really need your prayers. Or I just need somebody to, you know, come up and give me a, a neck massage or something. Uh, you know, to be open with people helps increase trust. So the seventh point of building trust is leadership awareness. And this is a refrain of mine, so I'll say it again. The first lesson that leaders need to learn is that they are not aware that they are not aware. So first thing leaders need to learn is that we're woefully ignorant of our ignorance. We are blinded to our blindness. We are not aware that we're not aware. We don't spend a lot of time. And there's a lot of quotations. Um, you know, we think of Psalm 139, search me, O God, know my heart, try me, and see if there's any evil, hurtful, wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Um, uh, Ellen White has a quotation, sorry, I've forgotten it, uh, the reference where she says that of all areas that we are most lack, most lacks, it's the area of examining ourselves. Of, we just don't do it. Why not? Well, how many of you like to be videoed and then watch yourself on the video? You know, your hands are shaking like, no way. Why? Why don't we like it? Because we see ourselves. I'm like, oh, I can't believe I said that. I can't believe I did that. Now I'm getting nervous just talking about it. Um, we don't recognize. And it's the same thing with self-examination. We are very unaware, and it is a problem. It's the problem of Laodicea, of course, right? Revelation chapter 3, 14 through 21, Laodicea is self-satisfied and self-deceived, and leaders have the same experience. And so to build trust, number seven, for me, the key thing here is leaders need to become more aware of how they're impacting their teams and the impact they are making on their teams. So self-awareness, we could describe it this way, the ability or the tendency to see both your strengths and weaknesses 
but still have confidence that you can do what God's called you to do. Now, strengths and weaknesses. Too frequently, if we see our weaknesses, we have a tendency to, to move toward discouragement. Or, on the other hand, if we see our abilities, we think, well, you know, I, I'm doing pretty well. But we need to see both of those. Um, oops. Oh. So she's talking about having true humility, and to have true humility does not mean that we are to be dwarfs in intellect, deficient in aspiration, or cowardly in our lives, shunning burdens lest we fail to carry them successfully. That's not true humility. Real humility fulfills God's purpose by depending upon his strength. Okay. I see my weakness. I know I'm not complete in and of myself, but I'm aware of it. And if I'm aware of my weakness, then I can begin to work with other people to try to compensate for that weakness. So let's go back to our state of mind chart. Okay, where are you now? So you're yawning over there. So you're down a little bit more tired, right? Where are you now? State of mind chart. For those of you that were here in the beginning, where are you? Minus one. What? Minus one. Minus one. Of course, he's working, he's focusing on this thing. I don't take it personally. Um, See, this, sorry, if you came in late, this chart simply represents where you might be on a numbered, numbered scale. One, minus one, two, and three is kind of sad, tired, down. One, two, and three are, are more positive emotions. Now, I brought this out earlier. It is vital for building trust in a team to leaders to be aware of their state of mind. A leader that is not aware of their state of mind is going to make traumatic, tr tremendous damage and mistakes to the team. A leader that is aware of their state of mind can make certain actions and changes to navigate how they impact the team. So if I'm a leader and I'm down here someplace, it is going to bleed across into how I interact with my team. Um, sorry, these somehow got moved around. Let me just read this top right one here. 50 to 75% of how employees um, perceive their, their organization's climate, we meant that, read that earlier, goes back to the actions of one person that is the leader. Team leaders influence team member moods and performance and potency. Team leaders' moods, their emotions, impact the teams. So it's very important for a team leader not only to find out how everybody else is in their state of mind, but manage their own state of mind. So how can we do that? Let me give you a few tips. First of all, pay attention. You know, uh, think about how you're feeling. And just realize where you are. You know, uh, we have a lot of problem difficulties sometimes naming the emotions that we're feeling. Many people are not very in tune. Well, how do you feel? Oh, so-so. What does that mean? Are you sad? You're tired? You're depressed? You're angry? You're frustrated? What's, what is the feeling? Pay attention to what you're feeling. Be, be aware. If you're in a team meeting or if you're meeting with team members and if your frame of mind, your emotional state is negative, you need to do something. You need to try to shift your frame of mind. Okay, so something happened to me on the way into work. I'm with my team. I had an argument at home or I knocked over something on the way out and now there's paint all over the garage floor and I didn't get to clean it up or something happened. I got an irritating phone call. Anything happened, I'm in a bad frame of mind. I come to work with people that are my team. I'm in a negative state of mind. I need to do something, right? I need to slow down. I need to find a way to change my frame of mind. How can I do that? Well, recognizing it, step number one. Uh, different things that we could do. We could think about what's the cause. Why am I in this frame of mind? We could begin to think of positive things. We can uh, start thinking of Bible promises. We, we could think of things that give us joy. Different tools that we can use to shift from a negative frame of mind to a positive one. 
However, sometimes it's really not that possible to change. You know, when the uh, emotional, excuse me, the electrical and chemical responses of emotion start flooding through your brain, sometimes it just runs through you. And what you really need to do is go for a walk or a run or something like that. But if it's not possible to shift, like I mentioned earlier, I would tell my kids, well, if you need an answer now, the answer is no. But if you can wait an hour or so, it might be yes. But if it's not possible to shift your chain of frame of mind, then you have to make another decision. Am I going to engage with my team or am I not? And if I have the ability to say, look, guys, I'm really not up for a meeting right now. Let's cancel it. Fine. But if the meeting has to happen, then what do I do? Then you need to share with everybody what's going on. By that I mean, hey everyone, I'm a minus three. And so if I come across intense or grumpy, I'm a minus three. Okay? And just so you know that, I know we got work to do, but I want you to know where I am. That's being vulnerable, that's communicating, that's building trust in your team. And so very important for leaders. So again, um, different things that we can do. You know, breathing is, is fantastic. Uh, let me teach you, teach you a new form of breathing. It's called the physiological sigh. Do you know that you sigh and yawn numerous times every day, but you never even notice it? Um, so the physiological sigh is really a great reset for the nervous system. And it's very simple. You take a deep breath in, and you take that breath in, and then you take another breath in without exhaling, and then you exhale. So it's a simple thing. And you do that a few times, and it has a physiological effect of impacting the uh, autonomic nervous system, and it begins to relax. And then you can do other different things, but the physiological sigh is like my number one go-to Thing. So that's something we can do to reframe. We can begin to think of positive experiences, the tremendous joy or love we have. We can reframe, try to um, tell ourselves a different story about what's going on rather than a catastrophe of something positive is going to come out. And then we, again, need to think, am I going to engage or am I going to disengage? So very important. Uh, as we think about these different aspects, um, it's 12 o'clock. What time am I supposed to stop? 12.15? Oh, 12.30, that's brutal. <laughs> you don't want to listen to me for another half hour. Um, let me pause here, because this is kind of a transition into much more practical things. Um, I've been talking about the neuroscience of teams and getting your teams together. The next little section is on how to be effective in meetings. So, but let me pause here, and if you have any questions at this point, let's take them, and if not, I'll go through the next little section. Um, I have a couple of comments. I thought your uh, explanation on how to build trust uh, par paralleled very well with uh, the parable of the talents, where the master, he gave each one according to his ability, he left them, he left them so they could do it on their own, and he came back for the entire so check. Jacket. Really appreciate that. Uh, thinking of the parable of the talents, I'm just going to repeat it for the recording as well. Uh, the master came, gave them talents, told them to go ahead, and then he came back and checked. He let them invest it the way they saw it, but there was accountability yes. at the end. Yes. Good, good point. I don't know if you've ever heard of extreme ownership. Seem heard of what? Extreme ownership. Extreme ownership by Wilnick Jocko. Mm -hmm. So that principle kind of. Um, Leaders are responsible. Exactly. Period. End of story. Right. <laughs> well, well, there. Yes, but owning the owning the um, situation. Yes. When you talked about accountability, and you said mutual, that's what I went to. It's okay. like when there's something that's failing. It's a team failure. It's, it shouldn't just be a person failure. I really appreciate you bringing that out. The concept of team failure. The team succeeds or fails together. It's not, oh, you did this great. The team succeeds 
or the team fails. Yeah. Appreciate that. Yes. Mm -hmm. As as I was listening, some some real challenges come to mind, okay. and uh, and sometimes I, I wonder what your position is that related to leadership and team dynamics, especially in the church. There's a big challenge of resources available because it's very easy for me as a leader to say, okay, this is what I want accomplished, and I just unleash and and just trust in the team, but. Where does the evaluation, are the real tools available for, for them to be able to accomplish that in place or not? That, that's a good point that I should have brought up under developing others. One of the key aspects is there, do my team members have what they need to do the task? Do they have the education? Do they have the training? Do they have the tools? Do they have the financial ability? That's very vital uh, in there as well. And sometimes we put people out, but they're not equipped to do it. And the equipment, again, could be experience, or it could be some kind of a tool that they need. I appreciate that. Yeah? I probably missed this in the beginning, and I'm very sorry, but do you have a set of <coughs> guidelines for building, like choosing your team? <coughs> choosing a team? Uh, I didn't say that at the beginning. Quite simply, um, the key, for me, a key factor in choosing a team members is can they do the task that they're assigned and they, can they interact well? So oftentimes we look at people that have been successful in one field and we think, oh, well, they've been successful here, they've been president of this or they've done this and we think automatically that'll transfer into another domain, but that's not necessarily true. I mean, they could be a leader in one domain but not have the expertise for another. So it's trying to find something similar in the sphere that I am and have these people done this? Do they have experience with that? And then they're, how they, well, they mesh with people. Those are my two main things. So how do you relate to that when it comes to you're doing ministry? So here I am, a leader in the church, and I am to do, you know, personal ministry, and this is my team. I mean, the church is my team. <laughs> how do you... So that's a more sensitive topic. A team, excuse me, and the question is, how do I interact with my church? Well, there you're not really getting to choose anybody. You have people that have shown up and they're there and they are your team. I still would endeavor to enforce accountability to like, okay, you're a volunteer, I get it, but as a volunteer, you've committed to X. That commitment's not just to me, it's to the church. If you're not able to fulfill it, please don't commit. If you are, I still expect you to fulfill your obligation. And having that kind of a conversation up front, I think, is, is helpful. Um, also, even in volunteer organizations like church boards, there are certain standards for how we're going to operate, how we're going to communicate. Um, I would still try to create a circle of safety there within and encourage free debate and discussion. There can be challenging people in, can be challenging people in a church. There are challenging people in church. I'm in a church. I'm a challenging person. Uh, so, you know, there, yeah, it's like certain people you just need to figure out how to work with. <laughs> so, all right, any other questions? Um, I just wanted to add a comment about the neuroplasticity. Uh -huh. um, Dr. Laura Boyd is in Vancouver. She does a lot of research on it for um, the recovery of stroke patients. Stroke victims, yeah. Yeah, and um, so she broke down the development of the brain into chemical changes, structural changes, and functional changes. And um, she found that structural changes uh, were more, uh, the most um, effective and, and significant of long-term learning and she said that what induces structural change the most 
his struggles. Yeah. So, so the struggles in our lives are really part of the renewing of our minds. It's really true that the uh, difficult tasks, particularly difficult tasks that we may not enjoy, create changes um, for us, which again is another way to reframe a difficulty that we might be having rather than, oh, this is a disaster. Okay, this is another learning experience. Count it all the way. I might ask you, because I know I've worked for many years working with different teams. I've worked at Uchi Pan for now, and now uh, have all the ministry. And when, at the end of your, your presentation, when you talked about the fact that, you know, sometimes when you go work with your team, something's happened and you're off, period, you know? Um, and sometimes, though, your team doesn't have the right spirit. Someone off, and everybody else is catching that similar spirit. What I found is sometimes you have to absorb whatever's happening and just kind of deal with it, and regardless how you feel. I've had to put myself in check, and that's when I'm really leaning on God. Every moment throughout that time I'm working with maybe that group, saying, Lord, help me constantly, and just absorbing it, because there's no, you can't make yourself vulnerable at that time, because uh, you, you may get, you know, chewed up and spit out, um, unfortunately, and we're just dealing with each other, we're dealing with people, and so these things happen. So, but I just wanted to get your point of view, when, I mean, because you can't always open yourself up to people and say, hey, this is how I'm feeling, and, you know, and sometimes you just have to, you know, say, I have to deal with this, and, and really lean on God in the situation. And just yeah. Because and, 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 you have to move forward with it, whatever it is you're trying. So when I'm talking about vulnerability, I'm not suggesting that every moment we should uh, open every aspect of our, our emotions of what's going on, but there are times to be authentic with people and share some of the difficulties that we're going through as, not as. It's a good thing to do, period, but it also builds trust as we're doing it. Now, if I'm in a, also in a meeting where somebody else is acting very inappropriate, that circle of safety, <clears throat> if it exists, will also allow me to check that person and saying, you know, the way you just spoke to me, that's, that's not appropriate. That's not how we, as a team, have desired to function. Um, so kind of going both ways there. Okay, let's just shift briefly here to a couple of things. I'm going to go through these. Uh, these are just more probably uh, to help your meetings be more enjoyable or effective. Um, and I mean, just kind of, just in the interest of time, do this. When we're having meetings, and everybody has meetings, the less the better, let me just say that. Um, these key points are very helpful. If I learn how to run a meeting well, then at the end of the meeting, it'll be very clear who is accountable for what. As we mentioned earlier, when we talked about accountability, requests will be very clear, they'll be specific. Meetings that end without that clear accountability are a waste of time. Unless it's designated who's going to take care of what and when, it's a waste of time. A second thing, before you're having a meeting, make sure you're, what you want out of that meeting is very clear clear to yourself as well. <coughs> By that I mean, is this an item that I'm just sharing information on and I'm just letting you know? Or do we need to make a decision? And if we do need to make a decision, what kind of decision do we want to make? Make sure that before you enter into the meeting, the outcome of the meeting is clearly defined. Another point here is, is my process clear? How am I going to accomplish what I want. So and so are going to give a report. Um, what's the process to get to the end? And this last point here, I'd like just to underscore it, preparation and engagement. If you're having meetings, try to get your information out ahead of time and try to teach your team to be prepared, to read the, the information you sent out ahead of time. Now, if information comes <coughs> right before the meeting, then you're sending a message to people that this really isn't important, you don't have to prepare. 
But sending it out ahead of time, it's like, okay, you've gotten it written. We're not going to spend a lot of time rereading it. I'm expecting you to have read this and be prepared. Be prepared and be engaged. And this last point here is be respectful of people's time. You know, something's supposed to start on time. Now, I know this is a cultural thing, um, partially, but uh, I'm not a particularly punctual person in my general life, but with meetings, I am. Because everybody's there, and if I wait another five, ten minutes for so-and-so or this person, I'm just respecting everybody else that has showed up on time. So be considerate about your time. One other thing with meetings is how are your decisions made? And this is important as you think about your teams. What way are you going, what process are you going to use to make decisions? There are the four different aspects here. Um, are we looking for something unanimous? Everybody needs to agree. Um, if it's not time sensitive and it's, it can take time, go right ahead. Sometimes you make decisions based on consensus. Sometimes you, many boards will just do a vote, up or down. Sometimes decisions made by one person. Be clear on the process by which you are making a decision. Whatever it is, there's not a right or a wrong. Certain decisions need to be made in different ways. But whatever the process is, be clear. And that's vitally important. Uh, for example, if you decide to go into consensus, you might have the situation where members really don't agree, but there's not that circle of safety, so they're not really comfortable speaking up. And so you don't really have consensus. You just have people going along with it. Um, so you need to learn how to give people, um, what's the word I want? A venue, an avenue in which to communicate where they are in the decision. So if we think about decisions, What's the decision to be made? Who's making it and how are they making it? Implement that method and then commit to the decision. One of the worst things is the meetings that happen after a meeting when a decision is made. People get together or they really didn't like that decision and then they work to undo that particular decision. But taking time with your process, and this is the last thing I just want to share uh, if I remember correctly. And this is a very simple tool, but very effective to get people to speak up. And it's very easy. So if I'm looking for a consensus, or if I'm just looking for people to sense of where people are feeling, I can ask the group, everybody put your hands down on the table, or whatever it is, and then when I say go, raise one to five fingers or give me a fist. So are you in favor of this idea? And I put up a three. That kind of means, well, I'm okay with it, but, you know, it's not my best. Or if I put up a five, what does that mean? I'm, I like this idea. What if I put up a one? I really don't like this idea. Or if I go like this? I really don't like this idea. When you do that, you automatically give everybody a sense where everybody else is sitting. And then if you have that circle of safety, people are free to communicate. And it's like, okay, how can I get this guy to a this? Or how can I get this person to this? Or maybe this guy needs to become this guy. But by doing this, Everybody is visually putting themselves out. They're not looking around to see what other people have said. They're not being influenced. And then there's an opportunity, okay, give me your reasons. Why don't you like this idea so much? Why are you in favor of it so much? It really helps ferret out issues in a, in a meeting. You've all been in meetings where half the people don't speak up. Church board meetings, board meetings, whatever they are, and many people don't speak up. This is a tool, again, to help getting people uh, speaking. So, a couple of questions to end. How is your team functioning? Scale of one to 10. What would you give it? Got a couple of twos, threes, fours. 
what needs to be strengthened or changed in your team? So just a question for you to think about. And then the last question for you to think about. You don't have to answer this out loud, but it's a question for you. What did you find most helpful this morning? What one, one thing was most helpful for you? Just think about that for a moment. Do you have anything? You don't have to share it, but one thing most helpful. Okay, well, thank you for your time. Um, again, I'm around, and if there's any opportunity you want to talk or discuss, and we do have some handouts um, on building trust, some information that you might like to take away, read, share with your team members, um, and share with others. Father in heaven, thank you for our time together. Thank you for putting us in teams so that we can accomplish more than we can do by ourselves. And we just thank you for your grace. Bless the rest of the uh, convention this weekend. In Jesus' name, amen.